Stephen. Mr. Carras. How are you, sir? Good to see you. Oh, it's so nice to see you. I, I was, uh, I guess we could start. This is very informal. I was thinking of some kind of uh, highfalutin way to start the interview. You got any ideas? I feel terribly underdressed. You're sitting there and- I do this for, I'm not wearing pants. <laughs> well, all right. I've got you beaten there. Okay, good, good. How, first of all, how are you? I am fine. I'm fine. I've had my second COVID vaccine. Oh, Mazel Tov. Thank you. Did this occur today or was this the other day? Last week and uh, aside from a slightly sore shoulder, I didn't experience any of the nasty side effects some of the people have complained about. So, that's, that's a great relief. Hey. And you look, and you look, you look fantastic, actually. Uh, uh, thin. And, oh, well, and, these are hard times. Yeah. I was, I was thinking, uh, you know, just something clever to say in the beginning. And I was actually, uh, I thought of my favorite quote, which I, which I got from your book, Raised Eyebrows. And it was the, uh, it's, uh, is the Piaget quote, the color of truth is gray. Is gray. Andre Gide. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I think about that so often in so many, in politics and in the news and in certainly regarding Aaron Fleming and Groucho and their relationship. It's really such a wise, you know, I don't, I tend to be a reasonable person, which pisses off people on both sides of politics because people will mistake me for being more conservative, except I'm a liberal. But then if I say something like on Facebook in defense of a Republican who happened to have done or said something positive, all the super progressives come down on me saying, that doesn't make up for the fact that he voted 99% with Trump on it. And it's like, I know, and I said that it doesn't make up for it, but if someone does something that's worth saluting, Conversely, I'll talk about how frustrated I am with cancel culture and political correctness, which puts me at odds with the progressives. And then the conservatives think, oh, well, then you must like our stance on things. And it's like, well, no, I have to sort of gerrymander my way through your standards because. Uh, so anyway, the color of truth is gray. Things are rarely, you know, all good, all bad. People are rarely all heroic or all evil. So, so that that uh, cancels out any kind of uh, 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 ability to look back on life with rose-colored glasses. Then, in uh, I. I had a copy of the script to the, the Broadway version of the coconuts. And there's a scene where the Groucho is calling out suggestions for Chico to play on the piano. And they're all puns, of course. And one of them was play, I'm looking at the world through colored Rosie's glasses, <laughs> and all I see are black specks. <laughs> it's, of course, politically incorrect, about which I don't give a shit. You mentioned <laughs> rose-colored glasses, so I think of colored Rosie's glasses. That's that's great. You know, I I didn't I missed that post of yours uh, that you defended or or spoke up in favor of any conservative. When when in fact was that? Oh, uh, I mean, I did with McCain. I did it with McConnell when, you know, I said this doesn't make up for the fact that he voted to acquit, but look at the things he said in that speech. Uh, and of course, Trump was furious with him and lashed out. And uh, it, yeah, it doesn't make up for it. But, and then there are times when a Democrat will do something that I disagree with. Uh, well, that's good. That's that's what America is all about. And in fact, with well, not in 2021, not in 2021. 2021, no. a Democrat who says something against Trump is censured by his state GOP committee, and his job is on the line. He could be primaried. He could be beaten to death. I mean, look at the hang Mike Pence people. Mm. You 
I mean, now it's not just political. They're risking their lives by daring to denounce Trump. So it's no wonder they're back to hiding under the desk, even though it's infuriating. But I can't help that. It's out of my control, despite rumors to the contrary. One of the things that I, I feel particularly blessed and, and other, aside from just knowing you, and, I, and I, I was thinking about when I initially reached out to you was probably in 2006 or 2007, after I read Raised Eyebrows. And the book really took on a, a life of its own, but not, I mean, far later than when you wrote it. And that must be really gratifying. Is it, could you attribute, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's popularity or it's, or, or it's conspicuousness out in the, in the world, you know, from, from technology, from internet. It seems like a lot of great things have happened. And you've been playing the Hollywood shuffle a bit on the, uh, on the movie version. It's been very strange. I realized that the hardcover came out 25 years ago. Unreal. Blows what's left of my mind because I was writing about events that happened 20 years earlier. And the idea that there's now more time between when the hardcover came out and talking to you than there was between Groucho's death and my writing the book, which seemed decades and decades later, um, you know, or the, the distance between when the Marx Brothers made Animal Crackers and when I worked for Groucho isn't as great as when I worked for Groucho till now. And it's like the it can't be because that was 1930 and everything was in black and white and he right. was young and live. And, and then when I worked for him, he was old and it was decades, but, and it's just a weird, and, you know, and I refuse to accept the fact, even though it's true that I am now several years older than Spencer Tracy was and it's a mad, mad world. And I, I don't understand how this, you know, his, his face was just like a large raisin and then white hair. Yeah. And he was younger than I am now. I mean, I didn't, I don't have a drinking problem and I, I don't have a bad heart as he yeah. did, but still, you know, or you see these, these matronly contestants on You Bet Your Life and Groucho will say, so what do you do? Well, Groucho, I'm a student at USC. I'm a sophomore and I'm thinking, how is this 50 year old woman a sophomore at USC, but the bulky coats and the hairstyles? And I don't know. I, I'm always playing that stretching, compressing game with I'm now older than John Barrymore ever got. And, you know, it's just a, it's a weird thing. Well, you never, you never uh, were a smoker, were you? Huh? No. No. Anything really. When, when you first sat down to write that um, 25 years ago, uh, when did you know that it was time to actually sit down and write? Because it's, it's not necessarily, it's, you, know, you talk about the, the color of history being gray. It wasn't the most pleasant experience for you, but when did you say like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna do this now? Uh, the writing or Groucho wasn't the most pleasant experience? No, he was, he, no, the, the Aaron experience. Was, oh. it, it, but when you decided- no, always overwhelmingly positive. I mean, there, were the, there was getting close to my hero while he's fading out and there's dealing with a mercurial, difficult woman. And I've never had to deal with anyone <clears throat> that had those kinds of, that volatile personality. I grew up in a fairly tranquil family. There wasn't screaming or throwing things, slamming doors or cussing. And, and I'm just dealing with this firecracker. But it was that was so eclipsed by how wonderful the rest of it was and, and how life changing it was. Well, it, it, since my job with Groucho ended in 77, I would have, I would meet people and it would come up in conversation. Oh, what was that like? Who did you meet did this? Is, is it true that he said this? And, you know, over lunch or something, I would tell them some anecdote. And then they would say, you should write a book about it. And I think you don't understand. I'm selectively handing you a, an anecdote, but 
I was such a postscript to his life. I mean, I came in, I wasn't even there for you bet your life, much less duck soup and, you know, uh, and he was old and frail and how could I possibly get a book out of that? Uh, but then I thought more about it, again, not in any compressed period of time, but as I was doing other assignments and getting on with my life, I would think about it. And then I started thinking, maybe I could write, maybe I could get the best stories and then write an article for Vanity Fair or Esquire or something like that about Groucho's last years and a, a fan's dream come true. So almost as a, an assignment to myself, and, and dipping into my interest in archeology, span I decided I would try to sift through the debris field uh, of my apartment and my brain, not necessarily in that order, mm. and see if I could recreate the sequence of events from being a Marx Brothers fan to seeing him at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in 72, to meeting him in 74, getting the job, what I, and just kind of lay out the timeline and, and went through copies of old letters and clippings and notes that I kept. And I started writing it and I was like on page nine and hadn't met him yet. And I thought, this is going to be longer than an article. Then I started uh, uh, fearing, which is really one of my skills. Fearing? Fearing, this is great. I'm gonna have something that's way too long for an article and way too short for a book. I'll end up with like a 47 page clump of interesting reminiscences. And then, but I ended up being able to fill a book's worth of manuscript. Then came trying to get a, an agent and then came trying to get a publisher. And that was, you know, I had to deal with that and tidal wave of rejection and it what was tough was my my acquaintances in the business thought it was a cinch to get picked up it's like you had a ringside seat to the final days of one of the legends of entertainment you have stories and insight and photographs that no one's ever seen that is it and so i thought oh well this is this will be great and then I started getting thanks, but no thanks. My cover letter said, this is not a biography of Groucho Marx. It's a story of a fan and his hero. And I would get rejection slips that said, we're not interested in biographies of Groucho Marx. And I would say, did you even read the, the cover letter for heaven's sake? But None of them read the book because I, even when I first read it, it was such a... a it's really a young man's transformation in amidst chaos. I mean, you spoke about a loving, you know, family from St. Louis who comes out to, to Los Angeles, not Hollywood. Uh, and, and here you're, you're put into this real negative, you know, situation, which did make right. national, international news. Yeah, it was so strange. You know, I was certainly always aware of that dark undercurrent. And then it became this battle between Aaron Fleming and Arthur Marx. And then once that hit the papers, it became positively surreal to realize that people all over the place now know what I know. Uh, and then it would be, you know, when, when Aaron was on trial, it was a nightly part of, of Entertainment Tonight, the latest newsreel footage of the Aaron Fleming trial. So and so the, the housekeeper testified today or George Burns testified today. And it was so weird to think that this private experience of mine was now something people could just turn on the TV and have and be privy to. So that was pretty strange. Mm. And then uh, I had always thought that it would make an interesting film. I, it, I mean, even when I was writing it, I recognized the fact that it had elements of, of Sunset Boulevard and my favorite year, you know, the, the aging legend and an ambitious woman and uh, 
the, the kid and his hero, that sort of thing. Um, and in fact, when the hardcover came out, my agent at the time would set up meetings with producers. And I remember one who said very confidently, I really enjoyed your book, but if you think that there's a movie in this, you're mistaken. There is no movie possible out of this book. You could use the book as a beginning and end to bookend the story of Groucho's life. And we could talk about, and I thought, goodbye. Goodbye, where's the ejector seat? Thanks, but no thanks. I mean, I can even see nowadays saying, you know, it's a, in, a, in a Hollywood meeting for a song with some 22 year old head of development saying, it's a cross between my favorite year and Sunset Boulevard. And just the look. My grandfather told me about those movies. <laughs> yeah, right. But, um, and yeah. then and, and, and a friend of mine in the business set me up with a director to have lunch. And I thought, well, this is promising. And the first thing he said was, well, if we did a film version of it, the first thing we'd have to do is figure out whose point of view is the film going to be from. Uh, and I'm thinking maybe it should be from Groucho's point of view. And maybe the young Groucho is still inside his head <laughs> wanting to come out. And, and I thought, you, our, our ships have gone like this right. before they've even asked what we want for lunch. Because if you don't understand that Steve is the vessel through which other people take this journey because he's the average guy that's starstruck and dumbstruck, pretty good, I had to write that down. Um, then how we ever, it's like, you know that it's gonna be a compromise if there's gonna be a movie version. There's always, you lose stuff because it's extraneous and you combine characters and fudge things and all that. But if you think that it's gonna to be told from the point of view of the young Groucho and inside Groucho's head, it's not gonna happen. And my, and. So I declined and my friend who had arranged it thought I was crazy because I didn't have another offer. Uh, he was interested and she thought it was, she said, you never turn something down if you don't have another offer. And I said, I'm dealing with different priorities. I want this done right. I, I, I'm able to trade in my cow for a handful of beans once. And if I don't get a, be, big beanstalk out of it, then, then that's it. So she thought I was crazy, but I'm glad I held out. This was a long, this was a while ago. How long after the book? That was a while ago. And I finally, and it actually it was optioned, uh, it was optioned by a, a writer director named Brian Levant, no, no relation to Oscar. Yeah. Very nice guy and was totally into it. And he had done the, the live action Flintstones with John Goodman and, you know. Um, but he and his partner were going to write the screenplay. And I thought, oh, uh, I, all right. Well, I guess that's on me for not having done that myself before we started the film. And luckily they weren't able to get it off the ground. So the rights reverted back to me and I took it as a sign that the carousel had come around again and that this time I could grab the brass ring and write my own initial draft. Also for the people like that initial guy who said, I don't see how this is a script. I see how this is a book. I thought I'm just gonna have to climb this tree with a right. saw and hack off the branches that aren't part of the tree so that they could see clearly, oh, all right. Yeah, it's, this, it's the dynamics basically between these three people as the curtain is descending on his life and the best of times worse. Okay, so at least I had that then to show around instead of just a copy of the book and asking them to figure out how it becomes a movie and then trusting strangers to take my child and dress it however they wish. So it was a good learning experience, but you weren't surprised at the uh, 
at the resistance that you were that you were encountering early on, were you? I mean, you, you weren't exactly peripheral. I mean, you've had Hollywood jobs. You worked for Dick Cavett. You were a writer. Uh, it didn't matter. I mean, you're always having to prove yourself, especially in a different medium. Um, even in television, you know, I'd written for Murder, She Wrote, and Simon and Simon, and and uh, wrote for for uh, late night shows, and, but you get you either, the two things happen one is you get typecast by what you've written before so they think you can't write anything but that the other is if you mostly written hour long shows they're very reluctant to let you do a half hour show uh it's like well you, sure that was a good script but this is half the length and maybe you'll forget how to have a beginning, middle, and end if we shorten the time. And then, you know, writing a book, I had credits as a Hollywood writer, but it was very tough getting a publisher. Then once I had a draft of the script, I was told many times I have no footprint in feature films. I'm a television guy. Right. I've written all these television shows. We can't get funding uh, on your name because it doesn't mean anything in feature film. But you need to ally yourself with someone who has the cred that, and that you know, and the clout to, to get it over the goal line. It's very rare sports illusion for me. So yeah. it's been a long and winding road, but, you know, I've never given up and things have looked good and then fallen through and then it turns out to have been for the best or a different way to go that's just as valid as it had been going down this particular avenue so did, did you think that it would have this second life or maybe even a third life because it's it seems that with every year i'm seeing you doing more podcasts obviously uh so many people, including lots of friends of mine, when I told them that I was going to be talking, like, oh, I heard, I've heard him on uh, Gilbert's show twice. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I never okay. know. I never know who's out there, those people out there in the dark. Are they listening? Are they, did they <laughs> always, I went a few years ago, I went to an art, some friend, friend of a friend was having an art exhibition at a small gallery in West Hollywood and I went there and so other people were talking and someone you know mentioned the Groucho thing and this guy just had a, one of those plastic glasses with Chardonnay in it and he turned yeah. around and he said are you Steve Stolier and I said yes and he got down and said oh, nice. oh God, you don't know you don't know I wish I was you and you know, it it always takes me by surprise, and it's it's uh, it's very gratifying to find that a complete stranger, not someone that was a friend of a friend, or someone said you should read this, or I sent someone a book or something, was just totally at the art gallery knew who I was. So when you say you're going to be talking to me, and they say, "Oh, him," instead of looking at you like Keaton. Well, I'm only I'm only friends with people who would know such uh, uh, cool references and, and interesting people. So you're uh, you're you're amongst a, a, a formidable lot. I was when I read the book, I, I think I'd originally reached out because I remember hearing my uncle talking about uh, visiting Los Angeles and going to Hillcrest Country Club and seeing Groucho and uh, I want to say Eddie Cantor practicing their golf swings in the in the dining room or something like that. And I was, it, but but the book gave me such a an idea of a time that doesn't really exist anymore. In fact, when I lived in Los Angeles, I would. It's still, I, it's still playing here. It's still vivid, and the whole the layout of the house and the people and the conversation, and you know all those people that represented young Hollywood then and you know, in their 70s and 80s, which is really weird. Yeah. And then, of course, all of the legendary people are long gone. 
yeah, I, I got in on the tail end of it. You know, there were still so many from the golden age and I was able to meet them under comfortable circumstances at Groucho, including Groucho and Zeppo and Gummo. Um, but, you know, George Burns and Jessel and Hope and- uh, Perlman. S.J. Perlman, Maury Riskin, Nat Perrin, people from behind the scenes of Groucho's film. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, and I never took any of it for granted. Uh, I never thought, you know, it's gotten old or it's getting too sad. It's, I, I, I always wanted, you know, one of my, one of my writer heroes is Robert Benchley. And he wrote, what was great about him was that he could devote an entire essay to something really trivial. Like what do you do with the two little pieces of paper towel that when you're in a public restroom and you pull down with wet fingers, you just end up with two little discs of paper towel. The idea that he, he recognized that in 1924. So he wrote a whole essay about toddling. Uh, and he said, I can never guess that I'll be toddling when I'm at a party. Um, other people, I envy them because they can say, well, George, I guess I'll be toddling and then get up and get his coat and leave. And he said, once I start toddling, I'm fine. <laughs> I've begun the process of toddling, but I can never guess that I'll be toddling. And so I'm always the last one there. And I was, I never wanted to leave the, at parties, certainly, but I realized early on, I was in this until either Aaron fires me for some real or imagined slight or Groucho died. But I can't imagine saying it's been swell. Mm. So I wrote it out till, till the end. What, one of the things that I think might set me apart and it's all thanks to you is, is learning about your father and his World War II experience. And, um, and I've really valued that reading the letters that you've sent. And I, I certainly want you to talk about that, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the, the, the road leading to the party and the road even leading to UCLA. I, don't, I, I know very little about you know, your family leading up to that and, and, and how, what Los Angeles was like for a kid coming from St. Louis. Well, as I mentioned in my, <laughs> in your book, in my book, pardon me while I grab this from the fake Zoom background. Now I'm going to get a seashell from the Malibu. No. <coughs> as I mentioned in my book, Raised Eyebrows, um, because I was from the Midwest, from St. Louis, uh, my parents were always starstruck. They were, even when we moved out here, my mom would often say, slow the car down and say, is that someone? Meaning someone we recognize, and like they have value because there's someone she saw on TV or in a movie. I had, I had seen the Three Stooges, Larry Moe and Joe DeRita promoting one of their films when I was in St. Louis, uh, they were promoting it. And so I was able to see famous people and I saw Captain Kangaroo and uh, he came with a one man show and that was galvanizing. <laughs> but beyond that, I, my, my ideas were, a lot of them stemmed from I Love Lucy where she would you know, go to a restaurant and there'd be a famous person <coughs> for herself they often had guest stars and it's like wow in Hollywood people just run into famous people and then on the plane out here in 62 <clears throat> Andy Griffith and Red Skelton were sitting in front of us and I thought it really is like I, I was pushing eight but even then I was thinking it is just like I love Lucy we haven't even landed and there's two I mean 62 the Red Skelton Hour and the Andy Griffith Show were at the height of their popularity. I don't know if it was because there were, maybe there was a CBS affiliates convention in St. Louis or something. It's odd that they would have both been on the plane. Uh, so there was always this premium attached to, 
you know, my dad, it's funny, my dad went to school with some guy named Stanley Niss. And Stanley Niss came out to, to California in, I guess, the 40s or 50s. And he ended up writing an episode of The Untouchable. Well, for my dad, that was just, wow, Stanley Niss that I went to school with. Uh, and there's his name on TV, right? He wrote an untouchable. And I mean, for the rest of his life, he would hold that over me. Yeah, Stanley Niss wrote it. And I, it's like, I'm accomplishing all of these other things. But in his mind, Stanley Niss from St. Louis, but it's like, but Steve, Steve, your child came out. Anyway, uh, and you know, when mom would come back from shopping, she'd say, I saw Simon Oakland that was in West Side Story or Harold J. Stone, you know, the character actors, we were good at spotting them. Um, but there was certainly no attachment to show business in our immediate family. Um, but I was fascinated by old movies and old comedians from a fairly early age. And uh, I had a flair for humor and for voices, but never thought either would be anything to pursue for a career. Uh, shortly after my mom died when I was 15, mm. There was a show called Letters to Laugh In, which was a spinoff of Laugh In. And if you had jokes and wrote them, sent them in, if they liked them, they'd read them on the air. And I sent, I, I thought of a bunch of jokes, just sat down and wrote them, didn't steal them. And I sent them to the show and didn't hear anything back. And then one night on the regular laugh-in show, Alan Suits came out of the joke wall and told a joke that was similar to one of the jokes I'd written. So I wrote into the show and said, hey, wasn't that my joke? And I, and I offered to, I said, uh, there's more where that came from. <laughs> I'd be willing to work for George Slatter for $1.98 a week. And I got a letter back from the head writer, Alan Mannings, who said, congratulations on choosing the amount of money out that George Slatter likes to pay. Uh, <laughs> um, you obviously have an eye and an ear for humor and should be encouraged to keep at it. And I know I said, if the spirit moves you, send us some more. Well, that was at a real low point in my life and getting this thing on the laugh-in letterhead, saying you have an eye and you're for humor should be encouraged to keep at it. I didn't get that kind of encouragement. I mean, my dad grew up during the depression and he was a very nuts and bolts guy. It's like, you don't get, you don't have an occupation that pleases you. You get a job to pay the rent and keep food on the table. And then, you know, vacations are for enjoying yourself, but a job's a job. So he always thought it was kind of self-indulgent to try to pursue a dream instead of just getting something and holding on to it. I'm, so it was always kind of dismissed my, my flair for that because, it's just, well, that's, you know, movies and jokes and stuff. But even... You know, I, I had a passion and still do for paleontology and archaeology. That I didn't know. I thought you were joking. When you said something about, uh, you know, my interest in archaeology, I was thinking, well, that's a way of you kind of going through the, uh, the hinterland of your mind for Hollywood anecdotes. Well, there's that. But then yeah. like, there's a piece of dinosaur bone. Oh, my goodness. Five million year old, probably part of a rib or arm bone. All right. Show and tell. Anyway. Stanley uh, Niss never had a, a, a dinosaur bone. Or a dinner. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but my, my dad acknowledged my interest in paleontology, but he, was, he wanted to push me into micropaleontology because those were the people that helped discover oil in the microfossil. And he thought that's where Steve can turn his interest into money, a paying job. And I thought, I, 
I'm not interested in micro fossils. I like dinosaurs and saber tooth cats. And right, like, right, right, right. It's like, but there's, what are you going to do with that? Teach history, you know. And and I was, you know, my first two years at UCLA, I was a history major. Took a lot of film history classes. They were wonderful and had a great library of 35 millimeter vintage prints. And it was great to get credits for seeing old movies and writing essays about them in a comfortable auditorium. That was wonderful. But again, I didn't really think that would be any kind of career path. Not that a history major was a hop, skip, and a jump to fabulous wealth and you know, but that's where my mind was at. It was thinking nuts and bolts, low, don't don't dream, don't think maybe there's something here. It's like, no, there's, you know, a friend of mine said his father was always telling him there's a broken heart for every light on Broadway. But, but forget about the fact he's living in, in, in the county seat of entertainment where everything is commodified and people are making a fortune. And you know, but like, I didn't think that I could. Well, I never made a fortune. No, no, and, no. You know what I mean? It's like there is the promise of that is probably even more so living in Los Angeles County than uh, uh, micro paleontology. Not the way Dad saw it. Right. He didn't see it that way. It's like show business is for these other talented people. You need to focus on your. And and in in my book, oh wait, wrong. <laughs> in my book, uh, the dedication is a left-handed compliment to my late father, <clears throat> because uh, at at one point in my Groucho years, uh, I was able to stay and have dinner with Groucho and S. J. Perelman when he was on his way back from one of his round the world jaunts and I ended up my favorite story in the book cornering him and having this talk that and people were saying where's Sid what happened to Sid is he okay is he sick he just went to the bathroom I hope he's okay and instead he's talking with Stevie about the Algonquin round table and recommending that I become a playwright rather than a tv writer because you have more control over the material and I was like, oh, my God. And, and uh, so when I came home, came back to the dorm, I was high from the experience. And I thought, I have to call someone and tell them. But it has to be someone that's going to know who Carolman is. I don't want to have to explain. I want them to go, wow. And I thought, dad, dad, finally, I've been so hungry for his pride and approval. So I called him up. And I said, I have just had dinner with Groucho Marx and S.J. Perelman. And he said, yes, but are you neglecting your studies? And once again, popped the balloon, which had happened at various points in my life when I thought, this for sure is going to impress him. And, he'll, yeah. and, uh, and it's like, you know, the truth was those were my studies in retrospect. That was my training ground for the rest of my life was having dinner with Groucho and Perelman, not reading about the, you know, the 18th dynasty of Egypt and uh, Akhenaten the fourth. So in uh, the dedication in my book is both affectionate and because I wrote for dad who thought I was neglecting my study. Um, again, he didn't live to see the book, so it's a posthumous tip of my hat, but yeah. uh, I did not get encouragement. I, I really was on my own, and that's why it's meant so much to me to be embraced as a peer by like Dick Cavett or Woody Allen. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have one of Woody's books he wrote to Steve, who I consider one of the few. Now, we don't know one of the few, what? One of the few people who can make me vomit with just a glance. No. <laughs> but uh, it, it's like a, that reassurance. Um, and then, of course, even when I became friends with these people, my father could only see it as 
what can they do to help your career? Uh, you know, I'll, I like to talk to people about conversations I had with them or things that happened or experiences. He was always trying to distill it down to how can he hire you? Who can he talk to to get you a job? Which it stems from an ability to, I mean, a parental instinct to want to take care of and see your children succeed. Yes. But it was so dismissive of my personality and interests and passion, because again, it was, how can you get a job? How can you get a steady paycheck and not worry about the wolf at the door? So uh, it was sort of like, in spite of all that, I kept at it. And I'll tell you, I, I, I spoke, I, I, I said something, my daughter's nine years old, but I, I think she was six and I, said something that was somewhat naysaying uh it could have been i said like i i i said something that invalidated a, a comment that she had made like i want to be a professional blah 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 blah. and i said well you better you know and and i saw her physical reaction to that and realized that i will never do that again and i will never diminish her in you know, unless, you know, I've got to pick her up at a police station because she's been arrested for disorder, yeah. disorderly conduct. But she, yeah. I'm telling you, I, I really identify with that. My mother, who, whose maiden name is Stoller, which comes from Stolier, uh, and I'll figure out how we're related someday. But uh, I uh, had a, I was living in LA. I had a, just a shit job in Studio City at a law firm and, and, um, one of the veterans in the in, in the book that I wrote about had passed away and I got a shout out in the New York Times in, in, in some article. It might have even been in their obituary page, but it was a really, really nice uh, mention of my name. And I told my mom that and she said, well, I wish they could give you uh, health insurance. <laughs> you know? Yes, the nuts and yeah. Well, <clears throat> a friend of mine had, uh, some years back had lunch with Ringo. Ringo. We won't use the last name to protect his privacy. His anonymity, right? He had lunch with a fellow named Ringo. And Ringo told him that when it was official that the Beatles were breaking up, he called his mother to let her know so she wouldn't have to hear it over the radio or the television. So he called her up and said, well, mom, I just wanted you to know that the boys and I are breaking up and going off separate ways. And she said, maybe you could go back to playing some of the local clubs around here. <laughs> she only saw it as you're losing your job. Right. I mean, and of course he was fabulously wealthy at the time, but that was her instinct. The instinct was, well, what else can you do? You know, we never learned to type, so we can't do that. Do you think, Bingo. Do you think that, um, people who grow up like let's say the Beatles uh some were more working class than the others or even Groucho uh they don't for Groucho never forgot being poor did he no and and he also he certainly didn't forget and this must have really been terrifying there were all those hard scrabble years in childhood and then vaudeville you know going by train from town to town and staying in weird places and varying audiences and the pay and all, just, and then finally becoming huge Broadway stars. And I'll say she is coconuts, animal crackers, able to buy his own home out on Long Island. I mean, a beautiful, you know, that's where the wealthy uh, authors and, and the high society live. And then, bang the crash of the stock market and he lost everything it was all in stock everybody did everybody had to, you know they weren't going to keep it in a mattress or just right. put it in the bank and he had to start all over again and that must have been terrifying to think the the lean years the hungry years are long gone i'm on my way i'm a big star i have a big i have a brand new limousine and house and acreage and a wife and children and then yeah. and it's gone 
Uh, no, he didn't forget the hungry years. And, uh, you know, he but it's interesting because he talked about how Chaplin overcompensated for his rough and tumble early years. And I think Groucho found it distasteful because he said Chaplin, if you went over to his house, Chaplin had a butler behind everyone's chair at the dinner table and all the silverware was gold. And he just thought that that was so ostentatious, but I think it still stems from, you know, I used to eat out of garbage cans and go hungry and beg for shillings. And now I can have a butler behind everyone's chair. And, you know, everyone has their own measure of, gosh, if I had a bunch of money, what would I do? A big fancy car or a house or something, invest in stamps, you know, whatever is your thing. Right. But Groucho never, he never did that. I mean, none of his homes were ostentatious, really. The ones in, in Hollywood were, they were in, obviously in, in Beverly Hills in nice areas, but the homes themselves, it wasn't like, you know, Norma Desmond's mansion or Hick Fair or something like, or Green Acres, which was Harold Lloyd's estate. It just went on and on and had, you know, all sorts of, fountains and bridges and animals and yeah i mean i i is 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 uh i and i've asked you about this before and, and we don't really have to talk about this uh, particular gentleman but in the richard and noble book i mean i i remember when you know when groucho wasn't cursing and saying things that were unbecoming to any yeah, yeah but I mean, he was talking about the, the sandwiches that he packed uh, when he would go, when his mother would pack for him on the train to uh, some engagement, and, and the way he described it was like he remembered being hungry and yeah. you know, eating that stuff, and uh, it, you know, also with uh, to, to get back to raised eyebrows and, and the, the color of history being gray. I had a fondness in some moments for Aaron for saying, "Well, why don't you join us for dinner, Stephen?" Yes. Well, that's why you can't just make her out to be Cruella de Vil. Right. It's not evil incarnate. There is, you know, I find myself adjusting. It's like if people are really tearing her apart, then I say, but you're forgetting that she did this and he felt this way and this is what happened. And then if they're saying, what a wonderful woman he was so lucky to have someone like that. Then I bolster the other side and say, well, not so fast. She was detrimental right. to his health. She screamed and all this. And it's true. There is no one facet of her that defines her. It was the complexity of her character. Um, yeah, I also, I remember Groucho talking about uh, when, they, when they finally made it I think in, it was before Broadway, it was big time vaudeville when they were making really, you know, playing palace and making decent money. And he said, and we went to a restaurant and they handed Harpo the menu and asked what he wanted. And Harpo said, <laughs> and coffee. He just ran his finger down. He wanted everything. It's like all those times they went hungry it's like i'm going to order everything on you know he didn't make a habit of it and he was not an extravagant guy none of them were really extravagant chico went through his money because he was a compulsive gambler but they weren't people that wanted gold silverware and butlers behind the chairs zeppo did quite well as a as an agent didn't yeah you know people often bemoan well they do two things they either bemoan the fact that he was in the marx brothers or bemoan the fact that he left the marx brothers he was never really very happy as a performer you know he was <clears throat> gummo was drafted into the army so zeppo was drafted into the marx brothers mm. uh 1918 gummo was the straight man in the vaudeville act and because they wanted to keep the four marx brothers they had to ask 17-year-old Herbie Zeppo, who would have been 120 yesterday. So if he were still alive, he'd be dead, I'm sure. Right. Um, You'd be a member of the 120 club. It's a horrible. Yeah. 
uh, the ultra super duper centenarian. Right, uh, right. He he was good. I mean, he had he was handsome and had a certain presence and had a pleasant singing voice and timing. But by the time he joined, the other brothers had taken up the major comic persona of Harpo Chico Groucho. And in the movies, you know, he doesn't have a lot to do. So after Duck Soup, he just thought, I've, I've had it with this, I, you know. And, and uh, in the book, I, I talk about when I first met him, uh, I went to see Groucho's one-man show at, at Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in late 72. And I knew for a fact that that was as close as I would ever get to Groucho was sitting in the back of this theater, clapping as hard as I could mm. and seeing him, this distant figure up on the stage. But then afterwards in the parking garage, I spotted Zeppo because I recognized him because I was so obsessed with the Marsh Brothers that I kept up on magazine and newspaper articles. And I had a rough idea what he looked like. And I thought, well, if I'm, I'm never going to meet Groucho, I'm at least going to meet a Marx brother. And I went over and I said, excuse me. He was with a young blonde and he seemed to have been unable to find his car. He kept looking at the stub and looking around and looked kind of irritated. So I went up and I said, excuse me, Mr. Marx, I just wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed you in your movie. And he said, you didn't enjoy me. You were enjoying my brother. And I thought, I'm so glad I went out of my way to pay him a compliment. Um, and, flash and forward to him asking you. Flash <laughs> forward to us becoming pals at his brother's house and him asking out the girl that I had broken up with. But that's later in the game. Right. But the reason I brought that up was he was always aware that nobody loved the Marx Brothers because Zeppo was one of them. So he left the act and became a very successful agent and represented such forgotten bit players as Clark Gable and Carol Lombard and Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Taylor and Lucille Ball and Lana Turner had a big, you know, he was very highly thought of. People would say, you ought to, you ought to have Zeppo. And he would also, he would also literally fight for you. He was a kind of a feisty guy and would get into uh, fist fights protecting people and sticking up to them. Even, even after he stopped representing Barbara Stanwyck, he went with her for support when she was trying to get custody of her child with uh, her, her earlier husband, Frank Fay, mm. a comedian that was apparently very abusive and nasty and all that. And Zeppo went to try to help be an advocate on her behalf, even though he was getting nothing out of it except sticking up for a friend. So, and the, and he and Stanwick bought a ranch out in the valley called, and they named it Marwick after Marx and Stanwick. And some of the buildings are still there. And they wow. they raised horses. Yeah, they went into business together. So, what about yeah, Milton? He, what about Gummo? Gummo was a, a businessman. He, he was in clothing business for a while, and then he ended up being Groucho's agent. Zeppo didn't represent Groucho, but Gummo did. And he became a shrewd businessman. And he was the one that would go in and make deals for You Bet Your Life and appearances and books and things like that. Uh, I think he had some other clients, but his main one was Groucho. And so, I, you know, I've seen numerous contracts uh, for different networks and all that that have Gummo signature uh, as his representative. Did he come to the house? Gummo? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gummo and Zeppo both lived in Palm Springs. And so it was rare that only one or the other would come up. It would usually be Zeppo and Gummo came up. Although when I met him, when I was there with my girlfriend, that, that was one of the nights that it was just Zeppo. Uh, and Gummo was, he was very quiet, soft-spoken, but still with that a sense of humor. And uh, I didn't have anything on me significant for him. I didn't have any pictures of them or books or anything. So I just took an index card and asked if he would give me an autograph. So he signed it and he handed it to me and said, 
you know, if this was at the bottom of a check, it might actually be worth something. <laughs> uh, but you became friendly with Milton or with, with Gilmo's kids, right? Never met them. Never met them. All right. I was thinking about something else. Oh, um, I wanted to ask you, and, and, and I and I value your opinion on this specifically because he is a friend uh, and you are very outspoken. I think it's very topical and I think it's very important because I uh, usually defer to you if I have any questions, but that's, that's how uh, Woody Allen has been treated in the media. And it's, it's something that I really wanted to discuss and, and hear yeah. you articulate it, if you want. Uh, no, it's fine. I'm happy to stick up for him. It's a complicated issue for me because my late wife, Angelique, was horribly sexually abused by her father and her brother for years. So I have had a front row seat to the devastating effects of child sexual abuse as a woman grows up. Uh, it was a real roller coaster for her coping with it later in life. And I, you know, went through it all with her and the memories and the flashbacks and the trauma and all this stuff. Um, if anyone could be forgiven for giving the benefit of the doubt to an accusing child, it would have been my wife. And yet, she was able to see through the smoke screen and see that Woody Allen, no one has zero history of child molestation. Then suddenly once does it in late middle age and then never again, right. you know, there, that's not right. And she could, she just, she knew that this was Mia's vengeance for, for Woody having gotten together with Soon Yi, uh, which is a completely separate thing that everybody conflates. They say, well, there's so many misconceptions about that. He married his daughter. No, he married his stepdaughter. No, he married someone for whom he was a father figure. No, he never spent the night at Mia's. He, her father was always Andre Previn. He did not take a parental role with Soon Yi. Um, and they, you know, apparently, judging by what Soon Yi and her brother Moses have said, is that living with me, it was just a house of horrors. Mia was super demanding and psychotic and abusive. Two of the adopted children killed themselves. And Sunni literally credits, credits Woody with saving her life by getting her out of the feral compound because she's not sure she would have survived. Um, there, I mean, there were other of the children, the adopted children had big time substance abuse problems. And me attended to abuse the non-white children more. Uh, the white children were given special treatment and the others were treated like slaves or maids, punished, locked in closets, denied food, hit, thrown things at. I mean, and um, and I knew from my uh, friendship with Dick Cavett, he was in close touch with Woody through all this and was telling me about Mia calling. Woody and screaming and, and, and slamming the phone down and all this stuff. And then, and then Mia calling Woody and saying, you took my daughter, I'm going to take your, just before the custody hearings on Dylan. Mm -hmm. And she, the night before the news came out about this sudden molestation accusation. She called Woody and she said, I have something special prepared for you. And he said, what are you going to do, shoot me? And she said, no, this is worse. And she hung up the phone. And 
uh, it was all, you know, it was so thoroughly investigated in 92 when this, and, and it's also such a cliche that when there's a custody hearing, you get these fabricated molestation things because the mother wants custody. Um, Mia chose the sex abuse experts at the Yale New Haven Clinic to be the ones to evaluate Dylan and all this stuff. She was the one that pushed for them to be the experts and Woody agreed. Also because Woody knew there's nothing to find so he didn't see any reason to fight that. So they very carefully and extensively evaluated Dylan and came to the conclusion that no molestation had occurred, but that she had been heavily, heavily coached in her testimony. And I think Dylan even said to Moses, mommy wants me to lie and I feel bad because I know lying is bad, but she tells me I have to. Um, and it's- Oh, it's her identity. Yeah, it was, you know, it was put to rest for quite a while and then Dylan grew up and I am, I'm fairly sure, I'm not certain, but I'm fairly sure that if she took a lie detector test, it, it would show that she is not lying in describing the abuse because Mia drummed it into her, the exact phrasing, the specifics, the train, the attic, he touched you here. And she would drill her and then for and then spent all those years till now vilifying Woody. Woody is bad, he's the devil, he's evil, he was horrible, he's a terrible. And so I suspect because Dylan was like five or six when it when it didn't happen, uh, that she has come to believe it's true. I think Ronan knows better and is being a good brother to his sister and is also. I don't know what his relationship has been with Mia. I know that he slept in her bed well into adolescence. Um, she had his legs medically broken so that he would gain an inch in height because she was concerned that he would be too short. So she had a doctor surgically break and repair his legs so he wouldn't be too short. Um, Mia certainly knows the truth and doesn't care. I'm amazed and, that Angelique knew this based on her own Angelique story. knew this and she also, and she, at the time, she read the findings of the sex abuse experts. You know, she brought to it her own years of experience and awareness and all that she had studied about it, about abuse and abusers and all that. And it's like, if yeah, if anyone could have said, I don't know, I, because she spent years with people not believing her. Right. And uh, her father ended up admitting to it and her brother admitted to it. And she didn't even remember that her brother had abused her, but he volunteered that. And then anyway. Did yes, your dad get he, to meet Angelique? My dad, yeah, he, he, uh, he was still around for the first year of our marriage and he was very happy at our yeah. wedding and, that, and he liked her and that was really cool. Um, but what's happened now with the whole Me Too thing is that you defend an accused child molester at your own risk. It's like uh, a Republican attacking Trump. You could do that because you think it's right and you think that Trump did bad things, mm. but there is a price to pay for that. And that's what happened with a number of actors and actresses who worked with Woody and were pressured. Apparently, Ronan would contact their managers and agents and say, unless he or she publicly denounces Woody Allen, we're going to spread the word that they support a child abuse. <clears throat> and it just wasn't worth it to them. I understand, even though it infuriates me, that whether they believed it or not, they caved to the pressure and the pressure of the times of the Me Too, reckoning, cancel culture, Harvey Weinstein, all this. Yeah. And it's so tough because 
so much of the Me Too thing is overdue and welcome and necessary 100%. after all the years of casting couches and God knows what. And it's nice to, you know, Cosby, it's nice to see these things, finally accountability, but there are, are some innocent people being swept down the sewer at the same time. And I guess the zealots figure, well, it's better that every now and again, an innocent person gets punished rather than let these sick monsters roam free. Um, one of the saving graces in the Woody thing is that he is so much more, how Woody has an astonishing ability to persevere and see things in perspective and not get bogged down. He doesn't hold grudges amazingly. He's not vengeful. He's very understanding and accepting. And, you know, if I see, if, if I had see an obstacle, if there's like this big rock in the stream, I stand there and scream at the rock. No, this wasn't supposed to be here. What the heck? And Woody's point of view is, oh, all right, there's a rock here. I'll go this way or this way. So it's like, oh, all right, well, if I can't make movies because of COVID and because actors are afraid to work with me, then I'll write this. Or I'll put, or I'll work on this. Or I'll, and he, he really, he's undaunted and just feels like he knows he didn't do it. And he knows many will believe that he did and that he can't change that. Um, but the, you know, if living well is the best revenge, he still wins in the sense that I think he's very content at this point in his life. His, I had a chance to observe him and Soon Yi and their daughters on the set of Cafe Society. And it was a remarkably normal, healthy family with a great rapport. Um, that's another thing. What, uh, what social services organization would allow Woody and Soon Yi to adopt two young little girls if there was even a hint that they were being put at peril? So, um he you know he has money he's left behind an astonishing legacy even if some people want to try to cancel it uh he's happy with his family he knows he has supportive friends out there that are supportive not just because they're friends that's why it starts to get me all the more upset is if people think well sure stole your sticks up for him because they're friends and he gave them a blurb. It's like, no, you're slapping my dead wife across her face right. by dismissing what I said because even she knew that this is what Dick Cavett called me as pathological vengeance. So I'll leave you on that high note. Well, no, I'm going to just tell you one thing. Uh, <laughs> the, there's still, there's obviously still a, you weren't going to tell me any good news. And I didn't know if it was uh, specific to the um, to, to raised eyebrows. The movie so, oh. is the movie is moving along despite yeah. COVID and everything else. It we have a script that I co-wrote. We have a director. The casting is underway, and there's a oh. casting director who actually has cast a bunch of Woody Allen's films. Okay, um, and. We're hoping to shoot it in the fall, but it's a matter of lining up the cast and then hoping that COVID is even less restrictive by then. Although I think the plan is to build the house set, interior set on a sound stage rather than shooting in someone's house because it's so play-like, so much of it takes place inside the house that if you just build the sets and have them there, you can also control more successfully if people who are deathly ill are drifting in and out. So we are, that is where we are aiming, but you know, it has been a long and winding road full of disappointments and dead ends, but uh, I'm feeling very good about it. And uh, the producers did, you know, after having, um, option the book every year which was always welcome to get that check sure they 
and several months ago hauled off and paid me off for the entire book rights, which is a really solid amount and not the kind of thing someone tends to do if they're just pondering or want to keep it one foot in having it but not be committed to it. So everyone wants this to happen and I feel like it's in good hands and I and I'm still a, an organic part of it as co-exec producer and you know I, I'm not being marginalized by the other which is really rare for as I mentioned before, a first-time writer. A first-time so, writer, yeah. How I will overnight listen. sensation. Well, Steve, yeah. I'm so I'm I'm you know I'm one of your biggest fans. I'm, uh, I, the, especially, and I'm the president of the Stolier uh, Midwest chapter uh, fan. Oh, board. you're late on your dues, by the I way. I know, I know. It's uh, the membership is up, but I I, I uh, we'll stay in touch, obviously, and, we'll, and, and there's a lot more to talk about and. Uh, I'm glad you got your second vaccination and um, let's talk soon. Stop me. All right. This was very enjoyable despite the technical glitch. It was all worth it. Take care. All right. I'll see you in cyberspace. Adios. Wonderful. Bye-bye.